<laughs> Happy days. Here we go. We're live. So welcome to Coffee, Eggs and Inspiration. It's a weekly show that goes out over YouTube and as a podcast over all of the major channels. And each week I get to sit with an inspiring person and listen to them tell their story. This week is no different. I'm joined by Jamie Roberts, Dr. Jamie Roberts. Welcome, Jamie. Good to see you, mate. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well, and it's nice to see you smiling uh, Smiling there. I'm going to give um, Jamie the typical uh, introduction so he doesn't need to do, do it himself. So Jamie um, is best known as a professional rugby player. Um, 94 caps for Wales, three caps for the Lions, uh, and a, uh, a very, very long uh, history of uh, top-level sport. Most recently, uh, Western Province in South Africa. In fact, Jamie's just returned from South Africa with the COVID lockdown. We'll talk about that. Uh, prior to that, Bath, Harlequins, uh, Wales, a long stint, 10 years, 2008 to 2018, uh, including the uh, semi-finals in the World Cup, 2011. Um, and uh, Jamie tells me, I, I did ask the question, a win over the All Blacks uh, while he was in the uh, Barbarians in 2009 at Twickenham. I, st I think I saw that match and I still feel the pain in my heart. Uh, but thank you for keeping the All Blacks on their toes. Racing 20, uh, 92, which is a, a, a French club, and Cardiff Blues. Uh, so uh, a long time in the, uh, in the professional rugby world. But also, um, I think a polymath. Um, uh, and a re renaissance man of, of sorts, uh, currently completing an MBA at Loughborough uh, and a Masters at Cambridge, uh, if that's not enough. Of course, uh, you've got to you know, load the plate up uh, high. Um, prior to that, graduated from uh, Cardiff uh, with a medical degree. So uh, Jamie is a doctor um, as of 2013. And, uh, and actually, uh, very recently, because of the disruption uh, of COVID after returning from the, uh, South Africa, uh, immediately put his hand up in, in Cardiff uh, to volunteer to go and assist the NHS uh, in the fight against COVID. Um, and we'll talk about that, just an incredible uh, act, of, uh, act of bravery and thoughtlessness. So Jamie, um, uh, where to start? What an incredible uh, career. Uh, let me start in the most recent times though and we can uh, we can talk about some of the other experiences so south africa was interrupted um by covid uh it sounds like it was quite abrupt tell me about that story what happened yeah so uh yeah it's kind of weird it feels like a lifetime ago some of that stuff um you just mentioned but look we, i went out to cape town end of january had an opportunity out there to play super rugby which was a, a league i'd never played in um and if you were to ask me what, you know, the top three cities I'd want to play in or live in during my lifetime, Cape Town would be in it every, every time. Um, and so when the opportunity came up to, to, have a, to go and play and do the thing I love in, in one of the greatest cities on the planet, I, I jumped at it and loved it. And it's just such a shame it got ended early. I know that uh, disappointment pales in, <laughs> pales in significance to, to what's going on in the world, but um, managed a good 10 weeks out there. Um, played six Super Rugby games and yeah, got to experience Cape Town and, and really felt like we kind of lived there. Um, and yeah, president came on the news. I think South Africa had the luxury of watching the the coronavirus uh, pandemic take place around the world. Um, and South Africa was uh, actually one of the last countries for it to really kind of um, take a hold in. And yeah, president came on the on the TV Monday night. And um, we had to leave before Thursday night because they went into lockdown. So it was a, a case of yeah, packing up our lives within within three days, saying goodbye, and um, yeah, haven't probably won't get the opportunity to go out now. Certainly, you know, before they start playing again. Well, that, I mean, a very abrupt uh, upheaval there, and and, and uh, probably true for many many of us. But you came back into Cardiff and uh, immediately. Um, thought uh, you'd go and help out. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, well, yeah, I came back and um, twiddling my thumbs around London for about a week. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a health crisis, isn't it? And I, like, having, having um, done a medical degree back in Cardiff um, and graduating in 2013, I thought, right, there, there are people volunteering here for the cause. 
I can't just sit here and do nothing sitting on a medical degree. So uh, originally, uh, you know, I spoke to the guys back at Cardiff, wanted to go out and help out in, in a clinical uh, in a clinical role. But having been out of the game seven years, I think they easily came to the conclusion I'd be more, I'd do more harm than potential good. Uh, Having haven't been out of it for seven years, so I actually assumed a role as a, as an innovation kind of fellow, and um, it was a voluntary role, and ended up doing most of my work with the communications team, really, and so using my platform and profile within rugby to basically tell the, tell the story of all the different departments in the NHS. I think we came, you know, I sat down with the head of comms there and came to the conclusion that as this thing was taking off there would be a lot of fear in the population, a lot of fear in the communities in Wales, certainly in Cardiff, and how we could help educate and potentially alleviate that fear would be telling the stories, writing writing stories from the front line um, about how the different teams are adapting. Because we've all had to adapt during this thing, um, none more so than, than the health service. And uh, it was it was an amazing experience just to see how the different teams were having to change their roles, having to adapt um, to what was happening and rolling out in front of them and telling some of the, I guess, um, less appreciated teams and telling their story because um, all people were seeing and probably still are seeing is, is photos of intensive care and, you know, seeing the graphs on TV every day in the UK coronavirus briefing. And, and there's far more to the health service than that. And there's far more change taking place in the health service than that you know it was, i just felt it important to to kind of share that story really definitely well the psychology of the the battle is uh, as serious as is the physical uh, side of things i suppose and and um you know uh what an incredible uh and stressful time for for those who who are in those roles whether they're um front right line roles or in, in support roles and, and and of course in cardiff the Rugby Stadium, the Millennium Stadium, was repurposed into a field hospital. Still is. Uh, you were the MC of the opening of the hospital uh, there. Uh, you've had many a battle on that field. None like this, though. How did that feel? Oh, it was very strange. Um, certainly, I don't think anyone would envisage that ever happening. You know, in our lifetime. Certainly, as a player, having grown up. Um, you know, the old stadium, it became the Millennium Stadium in 99 for the Rugby World Cup there and, and recently renamed the Principality Stadium. Um, and I don't think anyone in Wales ever envisaged it being a field hospital for a, a, a global health pandemic. And so when it happened, it all happened very quickly. Um, you know, the, and rightly so. You know, the NHS in Wales saw the numbers, um, you know, the, I think the doubling time was about four days. That meaning the amount of cases, uh, you know, was doubling every four days. And, you know, if anyone who understands exponential growth, that can, you know, become big, big numbers very quickly. And and I guess the NHS in Wales, certainly in Cardiff, did the right thing and prepared for the worst, um, you know, regardless of cost, I guess. You know, you can't put a cost on human life. And, and it was a case of, right, stadium needs to be a hospital. What can we do to make it happen? And it was such an impressive operation, you know, across all facets of, um, society uh, pulling together, you know, the healthcare service, the construction, um, you know, the, the, those working in construction. I think they managed to do it in about two and a half, three weeks. Extraordinary. Uh, which is unbelievable, you know, to see a stadium like that turn from a rugby ground into a field hospital with, with two thousand, to care for 2,000 people uh, was unbelievable. Extraordinary, an extraordinary transformation. And you've you've written so eloquently about uh, in your blog, uh, I'll link it below, by the way, if you're listening on a podcast, I'm, I'm pointing down, I'll link it below um, about some of the experience that you had. Um, do you want to give us a sense of uh, some of your observations? There? Yeah, I think I think um, writing a blog was, was interesting and it was actually quite tough, uh, purely because I've never written like that. So it challenged me in that respect. I've always kind of written as academically. Um, and so to write in that format was was challenging, um, and it was mainly challenging because having to write with to educate, but also write with empathy about topics uh, like intensive care, 
you know, you, you're writing about death. And it's and it's very difficult. I, I remember I wrote a piece on intensive care um, in Cardiff. You know, after spending an hour or so with the consultants there, um, and I went home and I wrote the piece. I got about three quarters of the way through, stopped, put myself in the shoes of someone who'd maybe lost a relative uh, recently, or or some you know knew someone who'd maybe passed because of COVID. Then I ended up deleting the whole thing. I read it back through. And I was like, no, that's not good enough. Um, because it it wasn't written with enough empathy or, or or in that style, so you know that that was that was a challenge, because it, also you can't you can't lie. You have to be honest here. You have to yeah. you know be honest about the facts. This thing is is causing a huge amount of pain across society. So yeah, being able to balance those three, I think being honest, you know, writing educatively and and also writing with empathy was was very challenging and. Uh, but yeah, but I enjoyed it, and again, meeting people and seeing seeing the struggles of of healthcare professionals was was pretty inspiring. And probably mainly because this is not a short term thing. I think when when this was unraveling, I think people in their heads are going right. Okay, this is a tough period, but we're going to be out of it. This thing is going to play out over months, if not years, um, yeah. before a vaccine is found. And so you know the dedication. Uh, as healthcare professionals is even more, you know, impressive when you think of it in that context. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely, I, I really recommend that you read uh, James' blog if you haven't. Uh, I'll link it below. As I say, it's a it's a heartfelt and heart-wrenching account of what it's really like on, the, on that front line uh, for patients and doctors alike. Um, let's move uh, to lighter subjects, Jamie. The rugby playing... Uh, fans uh, or players and fans who are watching this would not forgive me if we didn't have a conversation about rugby. <laughs> so, yeah, let's go sure. there. Um, you, you know, you've had an, an incredible career, uh, 94 caps for Wales, three uh, for the Lions and, and many others. Um, you've travelled the world uh, at the highest level of sport. What have been some of the highlights? What, what, uh, what sticks out? Well, I think you just said it, the, the chance to travel the world. Uh, that has been, I think, for me, the one of the best things I've taken from the game and being able to experience from the game. I think rugby gives opportunity like no other sport. Um, I think the highlights for me are, are the relationships you form with people. Um, you know, the tough times you go through with people. You know, really, really pushing your bodies to the limit, um, and then enjoying enjoying cold beers with good mates after. Winning or losing in changing rooms, and and as I said, being able to travel the world. You know, the, uh, I've been very fortunate to experience that through rugby. Um, some of it has come through international rugby. Some of it has been life choices I've made to kind of uh, enjoy make a, make lifestyle decisions as well as career decisions. And I've been very fortunate to be given opportunities in different countries to do that. Point, you know, case in point, being Cape Town most recently. Um, but yeah, it's been amazing, and I've you know I've travelled New Zealand as many times, mate. It's a very beautiful country, similar to Wales, um, in some respects. But uh, yeah, Australia, South Africa, you know, I think but one of the best tours I did was actually um, out to Samoa. We went to 2017. Unfortunately, I wasn't selected for the Lions in 2017 when they played in New Zealand. Um, I think I was deemed a bit too old then, but. I was named captain for that Wales tour. We we toured, we played Tonga in Auckland, and then went on to Samoa to play there. And I think it's I, I felt very fortunate, um, not just the captain aside, but actually to tour Samoa and play Test rugby there because it's once in a lifetime thing. You know, Wales I think have only toured there twice in the last thirty forty years. Um, and so there we are, we're playing a game of rugby in Apia, it's soaking wet, the pitch is dreadful. Uh, we managed to scrape a result out there. And, and I just remember being on the flight home thinking, like, God, I was lucky to, to even experience that as a yeah. rugby player. Um, because you know, most people go there just to travel. You know? So that's certainly been one of, the, one of the greatest things for me about the game, is the opportunity to travel and see the world. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it was quite warm uh, that day, as it usually is in, in Samoa, and they're, they're big. Uh, they're a big team, with both the Tongans and, and the Samoans, typically. Um, yeah. Any any game? Does any game other than the Apia one 
that sticks out in your mind as, as something, you know, for good or for, for bad? Um, my, my career early doors was littered with big losses. I, by big losses, I don't mean heavy defeats. I mean losses in big, big, big matches. And so, you know, I was, I was very lucky. My, my first cap for Wales, uh, and it was the only game I played in the campaign was in 2008 when we won the Grand Slam. And so here I am, young guy, straight on the test scene, experience um, silverware in my first campaign, thinking, you know, this is this is pretty straightforward, isn't it? This is <laughs> this is <laughs> this is quite easy. Um, and then what followed was, you know, I I kind of rose to the top quite quick. I think for my debut of the Cardiff Blues in 06 or 07, I was a Test rugby player. The following year, I won an Alliance Tour to South Africa, um, and I just remember 2009 being the year of epic failure. So in the space of three or four months, uh, we lost a Six Nations Championship decided match to Ireland in Cardiff by a 78th minute drop goal, Ronan O'Gara. A month later, I lost the Heineken Cup semi-final by a penalty shootout. I don't know if you've seen that game. We played Leicester in Cardiff and it's the only match in professional rugby and will be the only match that was decided by a penalty shootout. And so that was the semi-final. And then fast forward two months, second test, Lions at loftus Roosevelt, We lose uh, the Lions series by a last-minute penalty. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, come off the high of 08, you know, first campaign, silverware, happy days. And then into that 09, I'm just thinking, right, this, you know, because yeah. if those other three things go the other way, you know, I'm potentially a step closer to being a Heineken Cup winner you know, a Lions series winner in South Africa. I was lucky I got to do that four years later in Australia anyway. Um, and then another Six Nations trophy, you know, two on the bounce. So that was brutal. And you've mentioned the semi-final of the World Cup two years later. Again, we lost the World Cup semi-final at Eden Park uh, by a point. Yeah. Um, and so that was pretty brutal. But when I look back and when I reflect on those, it's those losses that motivated me to to go on and win. And with Wales, we won in 2012, we won in 2013, you know, back-to-back -back Six Nations titles. Um, and I put I put that down, you know, the core of that group had gone through that pain in 2011. And I put that success down to the pain of 2011. That often happens in sport. You know, yeah. you, you have to feel those big losses because they stick with you. I mean, they'll stick with me till the day I die. Um, you know, that emotion of, of coming so close but losing on the big stage. Because um, I think you remember that more, well, maybe not. You know, I enjoyed the victories, no doubt. Uh, but you remember them. They stick with you, I guarantee it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it would be easy, though, to allow that really to just, just to suck, suck the oxygen out of your, your spirit, so to speak. How do you pick yourself up from that? And, and you know, it's interesting that you characterise it as the source of strength that then uh, led to the, uh, the, the victories in the subsequent seasons. How do you do um, because I think it makes you appreciate that the little things matter in sport. Uh, you know, rugby's a team game. It's full of variables, isn't it? It's not like playing a, you know, it's not like playing an individual sport where if you lose, it's down to you. Either your opponent was brilliant and outdid you, or you had a poor day. It's down to you. Rugby, rugby is far more than that. It's a team sport. If your kicker has has an off day, but everyone else plays brilliantly, you can still lose. Yeah. Um, and you come to appreciate that there are fine margins in everything you do in training, um, your preparation. And if you can do all those things five to, five to 10% better, that, that becomes very cumulative over time. And I think we just found, you know, after 2011, we kind of look back where we lost it. Um, and you just work that five, 10 percent harder. Every training session, every, you know, you're put into pressure in training whether it's skills training, fitness training, you just think, right, I know, I now know the level I need to be at. And, and collectively, personally and collectively, you now appreciate the level you need to be at to win. Yeah. And I guess you can only really learn that from, I say winning and losing, but you certainly can learn it from losing. Um, and that, yeah. you know, that, that was where I was at. Well, we say we say that in business as well, and particularly where you know in the business I work in, in Google, you know, it's those glorious failures that are the the source of uh, of learning that uh, propel you to excellence. Uh, in, yeah, it's in a fascinating world. parallel. I know, I've never re I've never appreciated that in business um, because I've I guess I've studied and been a professional sportsman as well. But 
um, yeah, it's a really interesting parallel. It is, yeah, it is. Um, you you were part of the Barbers that that beat the All Blacks in two thousand and nine. Um, that must have felt special. Now I'm a Kiwi, so the correct answer to this is quest- uh, this question is yes, it absolutely was, Craig. It was super special because they're wonderful. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it was very special, probably because obviously it's beating the All Blacks, and not many not many sides. Uh, down the years have done that, certainly Welsh sides. I mean, the Wales haven't been the All Blacks since 1953. Um, I've come close on a few occasions, but not quite across the line. Um, the 09 Barbarians match was probably memorable. It's one of the most enjoyable weeks of my rugby career. Um, and the Barbars just... I love... I'm a traditionalist, and I love the traditions in the game. Um, I love the Lions, I love the Barbarians I, I was very lucky to play in the varsity match for Cambridge I think, you know, the Army-Navy match as well I think they have a very, very important part to play in the rugby calendar and the Barbarians just embodied everything that was brilliant about the game you know, it felt, I just remember we turned up at the hotel in Park Lane on the Sunday night um, you know, we met as a side and here I am turning up to a side you know, Matt Gitto, Jacques Ferry, Schaltberger, Victor Matfield, um, you know, Drew Mitchell, Joe Rocathoco, you know, all these players. And I'm I'm 22 years old. Uh, recently on the test scene, I won my cap a year early, first cap a year before that. And I'm turning up thinking, oh my God, I'm playing here with with people I've grown up watching. Um, but we just kind of had this bond about us. It, you ended up going out Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday, uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night into London. Awesome restaurants. So this was followed by nightclub. Yeah. This wasn't training, followed by you know nights out, um, and it was a real club hydration sessions they call them, great. Um, and it was a real kind of club feel about it. You know, training at times was embarrassing. We couldn't get the ball to the winger. Um, Habana was on the left wing, I think. We couldn't get the balls of Brian Habana. We kept dropping it because we were so hungover, I think. Um, and then Thursday night kind of, you know, reined it in a bit, Friday night. And I've never seen a group of lads get up Saturday morning and flip the switch. And it's something, it, it stayed with me, actually, and something I, I definitely learned from. Um, they flipped the switch Saturday morning and went out and we played brilliantly. And we played brilliantly as, as a collective and you know, the, the result, so I think Brian Habana scored a hat-trick um, and we beat the All Blacks at Twickenham. And it, and it taught me something which I've, I've kind of stuck with throughout my career as well. And th- there's two sides to look at this in sport. One, your performance is um, based on your preparation, right? So if you prepare brilliantly, um, well, then your, your performance is a formality. Now, I, I kind of... I agree with that to some extent, but I think the other the other dimension to this is is probably more important. You can prepare all you want, but unless you flip the switch for that eighty minutes, for what matters, that preparation is is pointless. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's what I probably learned from the barbarians is that you know we play a game which is based on relationships and it's based on um, you know wanting to fight for your your brother next to you. Um, you know, it's a nutritional sport. You, there has to be an emotional element of it. But you can prepare as best as you want. Unless you turn up on Saturday and, and produce the goods, it's pointless. And I, that's, that's something I learned from that game, and I've, I've taken it forward with me. I've, I've been very professional in my career, but I've also learned to relax as well. Um, I've also... Sorry, you've lost me there. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Is that, okay, yeah. I've also, I've also learned to kind of flip the off, off switch as well and then yeah. come Saturday it's all right here we go you know 80 minutes and being able to produce everything into that 80 minutes well it's uh it's the epitome of professionalism I suppose now we we have a mutual friend and I need to give you this opportunity uh we met through this mutual friend Gethin Jones uh tv presenter uh you know Welsh legend like you um, and we met actually. Uh, do you remember? It was after the Wales and Ireland game in in, in yes. Cardiff over a cold beer. Uh, and I ha- I've had Gethin on this channel, and he was. Um, uh, I think he was goading you to come onto the channel as well. So now it's your turn. You can you can uh, you can say what you want about Geth. Yeah, yeah, he's a very good man, and I yeah I remember our beers well, Craig. Uh, it was in 
uh, bar 44, which is a little bar opposite the stadium, isn't it? Where everyone heads after the game. Oh. I love that about Cardiff. That the stadium, isn't it? You just come straight out of the stadium. It's unlike any other stadium in the world. You're straight in the middle of town uh, and going to have a few cold ones. And yeah, Geth was there, and we've, we've we've been good mates. And I've I've loved seeing how he has adapted to life and in his career as well. And he's doing very well now. He's presents the one show um, at the minute. Uh, I think every other week. Um, he's worked bloody hard. He's worked really hard at you know developing himself and, and developing his line of work as well. Um, and I love I love seeing that in my mates. I love seeing certainly the Welsh uh, go out to put themselves out of their comfort zone. Not many of the Welsh like to cross the Seven Bridge, um, as they say. Uh, but he's he's gone and done that, and you know he's flourished in his line of work. So uh, we went to the same school. Like we always kid, Geth is a generation older than me. Um, he certainly doesn't look it, so I probably look 40 and he looks my age. But um, we went to the same school. He was he was kind of seven, eight years older than me. So, um, yeah, we have, we have that link. We're both Welsh speakers, both Cardiff lads. And, uh, you know, we both want to, I guess, make the most of life and make the most of, of, um, of our qualities. Well, definitely. And, and both uh, absolute gentlemen, I uh, have to say, did you ever play rugby against each other? No, that would be dangerous for Geffen. <laughs> it's a good one. Okay, so Geffen will enjoy listening. To he, he 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 used to give it. He used to give it the big one. I love this joke about him. He used to give it the big one that he used to play for Sh- Sale Sharks Academy. Um, and I always remember Martin Williams just chopping him down on TV, saying Sale Sharks, more like Sale Goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Geffen will enjoy watching this. I tell you, um, yeah, like, exactly. He rates like, himself. He, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like Gethin, you're a um, you're a musician as well. Um, I, it must be obligatory, I guess, in, in Wales to be a, a, a an accomplished musician, a guitarist. Sadly, you don't have a guitar with you, but I understand you played with the Manic Street Preachers. Yeah, so my mum my mum bought me a guitar actually uh, when I was nineteen, and I kind of taught myself um, just kind of tabs online chopping and changing between chords and i guess any song is based on chords isn't it so if you can change between chords really quickly i just thought right that means you can basically strum along to any song um and so yeah learns bought myself then in a, an electric guitar uh and i love you know when i've got a few hours spare just getting on the guitar and going on guitartabs.com and she's my favorite songs uh, and trying to learn them and I remember 2012, we'd won the Grand Slam in Cardiff. And I, the week after, I went to play for my club side in Cardiff. And I blew out my knee. I did my ACL. Had an operation. And I was sat with my mates uh, about a week later in a little cafe opposite the brewery in Cardiff on Trade Street. And uh, having a fry up with the lads. I think we'd been out the night before. Having a fry up with the lads. And this guy tapped me on my shoulder. And he said, sir, don't get up. Um... Good luck with your knee rehab. I just want to say you've been brilliant over the last two months. Uh, thank you very much. And it was James Dean Bradfield, who is the lead uh, songwriter um, and singer and guitarist for the Manish Street Preachers, right? And I've grown up, I grew up as a Welsh lad. You know, the, the Manish Street Preachers and Stereophonics to me were, were gods, you know. I kind of know every word to every song. Most Welsh people do. Uh, and here I am, like, all my mates are like, oh, my God, like, that's berserk. This guy has just said that to you. Um, and we got chatting. It turned out their recording studio was over the road. Um, and so I went, I popped over, went to visit. And, and we kept in touch. He's a massive Cardiff Blues fan, um, a brilliant man, and uh, kept in touch. And then they, it turned out they were playing uh, the night before the Lions test in Australia in 2013. And I got injured, missed the first and second test. He got in touch uh, the week of that second test and said, look, mate, we're, we're playing a gig down in Melbourne night before the test. Fancy joining us for a song. So, you know, I didn't even ask anyone. I just did it. And I was prepared to deal with the consequences after, but it was brilliant. And I, I was very fortunate. I got to do it again last year in Tokyo. Uh, so they played the night, uh, two nights before Wales played Australia in, in Tokyo. So same song. And I, Japan was probably a better experience because I managed to have about seven or eight pints before I did it. So I felt like a proper, felt like a proper rock star. Just attacked it, you know, arms, arms in the air. I wasn't uh, humble like I was in Melbourne. <laughs> what, a, what a brilliant story. Well, one down, 
uh, one to go. If Kelly Jones from Stereophonics is watching this. Here's your chance to ask. You know, he, he has to get you up on the uh, on the uh, on the stage there. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, lo I love their music as well. I mean, one day maybe. Yeah, me too. Another another gentleman um, that's just around the corner from me, actually. Uh, let's um, just talk about your, your your current, you know, return to the present, talk about the current situation. So an unceremonious and, and rather abrupt uh, end to the season back to the UK. Who knows what's ahead? It must be a, a very difficult uh, crossroads to be at. Um, talk, talk to me about how that feels and what's on your mind. Yes. Yeah, it's been very difficult, and I, you know, probably more challenging than I thought it would be. Um, I guess I try and resonate with other players, thinking, right, what would it be like to be going through this either early in your career, first couple of years, your professional career, height of your career, maybe your kind of big earning years. Remember, players are having to take big pay cuts, um, and then missing out on you know big games and international caps and stuff, and then. You know, here's me towards the tail end of my career uh, going through this. And I guess it's not the best time in the world to, to be out of contract, <laughs> um, which is, you know, I put a bit of pressure on. Um, and it, it's just such a strange place to be in. And, uh, and, the, and the most challenging part for me, I think, has been to try and stay motivated and train and push myself to train and stay fit without knowing what I'm training for and without knowing what I'm, I'm kind of pushing myself for um i'm not quite sure what the immediate future holds um and certainly the the medium term future uh, i'm still quite confused with what i want to do after my professional career and I, I guess for every rugby player on the planet this pandemic has brought that into focus isn't it it's kind yeah. of it's made us i think it's made us all go okay right if we didn't have rugby what would we want to do and what would we want to try and achieve um so yeah there's been a lot of thinking time a lot of uh, the time, which is which is always good, and you know I've just got to trust that these things will work out. Um, I still want to play for another couple of years. Uh, still feel good enough. You know, I was really enjoying Super Rugby. You know, felt fit, felt strong, was putting in good performances. Um, and still, you know, I want to play at a professional level for for a couple of years yet. Where that'll be, I couldn't tell you, Craig, and I I haven't got a haven't got a clue. But yeah, I'll just keep uh, keep training. And uh, hope things will work out, as I said. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure they will. Uh, you know, you're a, an overachieving polymath, whether it's professional sport, medicine, uh, or anything else you you turn your uh, mind to. I'm sure. And it's start a band, I think. Start a band, even. Start a band. Yeah, we exactly. Drag on. Kelly Jones away from the Seraphonics and start a band. That, well, that would be ja Jamie and Kelly. We could call it Jamie and Kelly uh, band. That, that'd be good. Two guitarists and uh, do you sing as well? I can sing, but no one near as good as him, mate. Jesus. Yeah, well, <laughs> He's, uh, every I'm Welshman not. can sing, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Listen, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, you're a real inspiration in, in everything that you've done and uh, will continue to do, I'm sure. Jamie Roberts, thanks very much for joining me. Top man. Look forward to a cold beer, mate.